Well, today we are continuing on in our study of the story, an abridged and chronological version of the Bible. And if you've been tracking with us this week, we read chapter 29, entitled Paul's Mission. In chapter 28, we were first introduced to Saul, who later became Paul. And prior to his conversion, he was, by no stretch of the imagination, a religious terrorist. But after a radical encounter with Jesus, he became a follower of Jesus and arguably one of the most influential ministers to ever walk the face of the earth. A large chunk of the New Testament, which we are still reading, studying, and being discipled by nearly 2,000 years later, has its authorship attributed to Paul. And if you read through chapter 29 this week, you read through abridged versions of a number of Paul's writings. If you did make it through chapter 29 this week, you owe yourself a big pat on the back because this was easily the longest chapter in the story. Uh, it covers several chapters from the book of Acts, uh, one of Paul's letters to the church at Thessalonica, uh, one of his letters to the Corinthians, his letter to the Galatians, and also his letter to the Romans. So a significant chunk of the New Testament. And of course, uh, I have the distinct honor and privilege of trying to help us make some sense of it. Uh, obviously, given the sheer amount of content, it would be impossible for us to, in one sermon, uh, try to unpack all of the details of what we read. But remember that one of the primary purposes of our study of the story is to try to gain an understanding of the Bible as one continuous story, which is what it really is. And one of the challenges we have in reading and studying the Bible is that we often get lost in the details and we lose sight of the overarching storyline. Perhaps you've heard the analogy of losing sight of, of the forest for the trees. So in reading through the story and observing the, the trees, if you will, uh, we have to be intentional about taking time to rise above the trees so that we can see where those trees fit in relation to their place in the forest, the overarching story of redemptive history. And so in doing that, we keep coming back to this question. Uh, what is God doing in this portion of his story? And what does it mean for us? This is what we've been referring to as the upper story. Uh, what God is doing up there in his quest to redeem humanity from the curse of sin. And it's represented in these five movements of scripture that we've been talking about for quite some time. Chapters 28, uh, 29, and 30 fall within the framework of movement four of the upper story. So as we ask that question of this section of scripture, what is God doing in this portion of his story and what does it mean for us? The answer to that question, as John began to unpack last week, is that God is building his church, which is made up of every true follower of Jesus who has walked the earth, who is walking the earth, and who will one day still walk the earth. And he's building his church to know him, to love him, to serve him, to follow him, and to represent him here on this earth. The Bible uses the metaphor, the body of Christ, to describe the church, uh, meaning that we are the representation of Jesus on the earth today. We are his hands, his feet, his mouthpiece, and so on. And others are going to encounter Jesus living in and through us. As John mentioned last week, this is our portion of the story. We are living in the midst of movement four where God is building his church to know him, to love him, to serve him, to follow him, and to represent him here on this earth. And so if this is the primary thrust of this section of scripture, 
then as members of God's church living in the midst of this movement, uh, we can rightly assume that there is a great deal for us to learn from this section of the story. And so that's really where I want to focus my time and energy today on hopefully helping us to unpack some principles, thoughts, and ideas from this section of the text that help us to hone in on the overarching storyline of this section of scripture and that can hopefully serve as somewhat of a model for us as we live in the midst of this movement. Again, the title of this chapter is Paul's Mission. And broadly speaking, uh, the story focuses on how Paul responded to God's call on his life and how he lived as a follower of Jesus during his life in the midst of Movement 4. Paul was really a forerunner in this particular movement, uh, along with the other early apostles. And it struck me as I was reading through this chapter that there are a number of principles, thoughts, and ideas that we see in the unfolding of Paul's story that I think also ring true for us as followers of Jesus today. And so what I want to do is is look at uh, Paul's life and ministry as kind of a model for us as we continue to live into this movement that started with Paul's generation. So the first big idea and the foundation that all of this rests upon is the call to go and preach the gospel. In Matthew 28, before Jesus ascended to heaven, he met with his disciples and commissioned them to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything Jesus had commanded. In Mark's gospel, uh, he records Jesus commissioning his disciples to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to all creation. And John led us through a study last week of Luke's record of Jesus' words to his disciples in Acts 1.8, that they would receive power when the Holy Spirit came on them, and they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And we unpacked how Jesus' disciples are empowered by the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses everywhere. This is our primary calling, and it is the launch into and the foundation of Movement 4. This is how God is building his church. And I hope you didn't miss the significance and the importance of the role of God's Spirit in this work. He is the power source. Without the Holy Spirit, it's like trying to use a lamp that's been unplugged from the wall or a flashlight that has no batteries. It's useless. And as those who are commissioned to live our lives as witnesses for Jesus, if we are disconnected from our power source, from the Holy Spirit, our work is useless and we will accomplish nothing. And Jesus knew this uh, prior to the promise he made to his disciples recorded in Acts 1.8. In verse 4, we read Jesus' command to them to not leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the gift the Father had promised, which was the Holy Spirit. Prior to the day of Pentecost and the gift of the Spirit being poured out, the disciples were a bunch of bumbling idiots that they had no clue what was going on, and they weren't able to accomplish anything. But when the Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, everything changed. And this wasn't just the case for Jesus' first 12 disciples. This has been and will always be the case for every follower of Jesus. Again, the Holy Spirit is our power source. And without the work of God's Spirit in and through our lives, we will accomplish nothing. 
And this was certainly the case for Paul and his companions as they responded to the call that God had on their lives. Uh, Early on in chapter 29, we read the account of Paul and Barnabas being sent out on their first missionary journey uh, from Acts chapter 13. And the text says that while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then in verse four, it says, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went. So we see that their whole journey was initiated and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I don't know if you took note of it or not, but one of the things that struck me as I was reading through this chapter was the number of times the text used phrases like by the Spirit or through the Spirit or filled with the Spirit. Again, the primary idea being that in our call to go and preach the gospel, to live as witnesses for Jesus, the Holy Spirit is our power source. And again, without the power of the Holy Spirit at work in and through our lives, we will accomplish nothing. The second thing that stuck out to me under this umbrella of the call to go and preach the gospel is the intentionality of Paul and his companions. Everywhere they went, they were looking for every opportunity to share the good news about Jesus. With every new city they visited, uh, we read about how they would intentionally Uh, visit the Jewish synagogues, the the marketplaces, the community gathering places, the places of prayer. Again, strategically looking for opportunities and places where they could intentionally share Jesus with people. And I think it speaks to this idea that sharing the gospel and making disciples takes intentionality. We don't stumble into accidentally sharing the gospel or accidentally making disciples. We have to be intentional about it. We have to make time and space for it. We have to keep our eyes open and look for opportunities. We have to be persistent in it regardless of the response we receive. I want to read for you a section of the text from chapter 29. This is not a a section from scripture itself, uh, but is one of the summary paragraphs added into the story uh, by the editors. But I think it speaks well to this idea and also launches us then into our next big idea. So he writes, when visiting a new city, uh, Paul and Barnabas typically went first to the Jewish synagogue. Uh, Not only did they feel that doing so was God's directed priority, uh, but the synagogue's building and uh, regularly scheduled meetings provided a convenient location and a designated time for proclaiming the gospel. The good news, he writes, was often met with mixed results among the Jews. Uh, Some gratefully embraced the message, while others rejected it out of disbelief. Within the mainstream Gentile community, some of the resistance to God's good news was motivated by pure economics. Each new follower of Jesus meant one less buyer of charms and idle merchandise, which was big business in many cities. Some of the opposition was political, as each convert subtracted from the number and clout of the leading religious groups. Much of it was personal, since believing in Jesus changed people and thus threatened the status quo. So again, he speaks to the intentionality of Paul and Barnabas in strategically looking for opportunities to share. 
But he also speaks then to the next big idea in the chapter that I wanted to highlight for us, and that is the reality of opposition. We clearly see this again and again in the unfolding of Paul's story. Everywhere he went, he faced opposition. And it was not the exception to the rule, it was the rule. And the Bible seems to point us to this reality that as followers of Jesus, commissioned to go into all the world and to preach the gospel, we should not be surprised by opposition, but that we should actually expect it. John chapter 15 Uh, records one of the final conversations Jesus had with his disciples prior to being crucified. And in verses 18 to 20, he says, If the world hates you, uh, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes, We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way as you well know. Again, I think the biblical reality is that as we live the lives God has called us to live, and as we do the things he has called us to do, we should not be surprised by opposition. Again, we should expect it. As Paul wrote, we are destined for it. And I think this is something we really have to grapple with as modern day followers of Jesus. Because I think that most of us, myself included, rather than expecting and embracing opposition, we cower in the face of it. And we almost treat it as a sign from God that we should back off, right? Uh, but, But that was not the case for Paul and for many of the early followers of Jesus, nor is it what scripture seems to call us to. So if this is the case, If we are indeed called to go and preach the gospel, and in the midst of doing that, we are destined for and should expect opposition, then what hope do we have? Why in the world would we keep going in the face of opposition? Well, what do we see in the text? Why did Paul and so many of the early followers of Jesus keep going in the face of tremendous opposition? Well, I think number one, they understood that this is part of God's plan and that God has a purpose in it. Again, we already looked at at, at Jesus' words that no servant is greater than his master and that if they persecuted him, which they did, they will certainly persecute us as his followers. And we looked at Paul's words to the Thessalonians that we are are destined for trials. We are destined for persecution. We should expect it. Paul also writes in, in chapter eight of his letter to the Romans that if we are children of God, then we are heirs. We are heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. What a great promise, right? But we are co-heirs with Christ, he says, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So there is an assumption that if we truly are God's children, then we will share in the sufferings of Christ. But we also then get to share in his glory. He writes in chapter five of the same letter 
we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Amen? But he also says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Why? Because we know, he says, that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. We don't have a ton of time to unpack this today, but the big idea is that we embrace and glory in opposition, hardships, trials, and suffering, not because we're sadistic and enjoy suffering, that would be foolish, but because we know that God is using it and that he's actually doing something through it. According to Paul, God uses suffering in our lives to produce perseverance, which in turn produces Christ-like character in us, which results then in an immovable, unshakable hope. And that word hope is not defined in the way we often define it, like wishful thinking. I hope everything's going to turn out okay. That word hope is is actually defined as confident expectation in God. That as we have endured through some challenges in life and God has in turn built Christ-like character in us, we have seen and experienced the goodness and the faithfulness of God in the midst of those trials and it results in a confident expectation in who he is. Peter and James describe it in their letters as the testing and the proving of our faith. Paul speaks to this again back in chapter 8 as he's talking about the present sufferings the Romans were enduring. He says, And we know that in all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God uses everything. He doesn't waste one moment And in every circumstance, the good, the bad, and everything in between, God is working for our benefit and for our good. And so again, in response to the question of what hope do we have and why in the world would we keep going in the face of opposition, the answer to that question is that we recognize this is part of God's plan and that he has a purpose in it. And again, he's using it for our good and for his glory. The second thing I would point to is the reality of God's power with us in the face of opposition. Again, we don't have a ton of time to fully unpack this now, but in a nutshell, uh, over and over again, we see the reality of God's work, um, God's power at work in Paul's life in the miracles that took place Uh, in supernatural provision, in the safety God provided for them, in the midst of some really hostile situations, and in the wisdom God provided in where to go and how to respond to various situations that they faced. Which leads us then to the third point. Why do we hope? Why do we continue on in the face of opposition? Because we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. Why do we have nothing to fear? Uh, Because again, God is with us and because God is for us, right? His power is at work in our lives. This is what Paul writes uh, back in Romans 8. In verse 31, he, he asks the question, what then shall we say in response to these things? And he answers that question with another question saying, if God is for us, who can be against us? If you didn't catch it, that is a a rhetorical question. Uh, We should assume the answer to that. And the answer to that question is no one. This is God we're talking about, the one who reigns supreme and who is sovereign over all creation. So if God is for us, who could possibly be against us? There is nothing that is beyond his reach and there is nothing 
that is beyond his control. And I think it really comes down to a question of trust, doesn't it? Do we really trust him? Do we trust that he is who he says he is and that he can and will do the things he says he will do? Do we trust that he's actually with us and that he's actually moving and working on our behalf? Do we trust that nothing can harm us unless God allows it? Listen, the biblical reality is that with God on our side, we have absolutely nothing to fear. And the question we all have to wrestle with is, do we believe that? The last thing I would leave you with as we process this chapter and consider why we would continue on in the face of opposition is because of the hope of eternity. Because of the hope of eternity. Paul writes about this in chapter 15 of his letter to the Corinthians. And he says in in verse 19, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. If it's just for this life that we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. If there's no resurrection and there's no hope of eternity, why in the world would we deny ourselves and follow Christ in this life? Why would we ever give our lives for the sake of the gospel? Why would we go out of our way to share Jesus with people? Why would we face ridicule and persecution and hardship? Why not just live it up, right? And that's actually exactly what Paul says in verse 32. He writes, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Just live it up. But he goes on to say after his comments in verse 19 that if this life is all there is, then we are most to be pitied. He goes on to say in verse 20 that Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The idea of first fruits is the first among many. So Christ has been raised as the first of many who have died. This is the hope of where our faith lies, that that this life is not all there is. And when this life is over, we will go to spend eternity time without end, forever and ever and ever and ever and ever with God in paradise. And so when we live with an eternal perspective, understanding that this life is not all there is, and that how we live our lives on this earth impacts how we live in eternity, suddenly we realize that 80, 90, or 100 years, the, the 80, 90, or 100 years we might live on this earth is but a drop in the bucket compared to time without end in paradise with God. And I believe it's that realization that led Paul to write these words in Romans 8 18. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. They're not even on the same playing field. They're not even worth comparing, Paul says. It's not in our reading for this week, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, writing about this same subject, Paul writes these words. He says, For our light and momentary troubles, that's how he describes them, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So what do we do? He says, We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We live with an eternal perspective. 
Listen, you could suffer every single day of your life for 90 years. And in the scope of eternity, it would be, as Paul describes it, light and momentary compared to the surpassing greatness of the glory that will be revealed. No matter how much we suffer on this earth, as Paul says, it's not even worth comparing to what awaits us in eternity. So so what do we do? How do we respond? We are a people who have been called to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to all creation. And the reality is, as we do that, like Paul, we will face opposition. So how do we respond? How do we keep going in the midst of that? Well, I just want to leave you with the challenge that Paul gave to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He writes these words, and I hope you will internalize these words as a challenge to yourself in your own calling to go and preach the gospel. Therefore, he says, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. What do we do? How do we respond in the face of opposition? We stand firm in the face of it. And as he goes on to say, we let nothing move us. Be immovable, be unshakable in your faith. And we always, always, always give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Why? Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen? Amen.